Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. If you wouldn't mind as you're loading in, um, you know, I'm going to put you all on the spot throughout this. As, as a professor, I like to flip the classroom around and uh, really have a seminar style um, just for that. And, and just a conversation. But as you're loading Almost. in, if you wouldn't mind putting in chat what your gaming experience <laughs> is. Have you ever competed in a game? Uh, what video game is your favorite? Have you not played since Pong or Intergalactic, you know, Space War, right? Like, what is your gaming experience? I, I would love to understand so I can cater some examples to that throughout. Jeff playing Warzone. I love that. I, I am a, I'll, I'll go into my background a little bit, but uh, I'm a Call of Duty guy through and through. Absolutely zero FPS for me. Avid amateur gamer, first person shooters, RPGs, solitaire. I love that, Michelle. Uh, oh, the incredible machine. You know, I used to play that, <laughs> gosh, two decades ago, and I could not remember for the life of me what it was. And I saw a video on it recently, and it was like the nostalgia came just pouring in of just hours of trying to solve how to get that marble into a basket or whatever, right? <laughs> I don't understand why there isn't anything else out like that. I mean, I can't be the only one fascinated with Rube Goldberg machines. <laughs> Are you talking about any kind of games? Any kind of games. It can be Candy Crush, Trivia <laughs> Crack. Uh, those are mobile games, right? Uh, I just started playing 3D Match. Okay. What does what does three D match entail? Well, each screen you have to match in groups of three, and it looks like a jumbo of stuff. And they're actually three D. Like they're three D. I'm being coached here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, we got Frogger in the chat. Okay, I'm loving this. Like Halo. Okay. Uh, which Halo is your favorite? I played them all, so I mean, that's probably, my son talking. Um, I'm the type that whenever they would come out, we would get them at midnight or whatever it was, and oh, play yeah. them through the night and beat them by the next morning. <laughs> you would stand in line at GameStop for the midnight yep. release. Yep. I, yeah. Yeah. Yep. With all the digital and, downloads now, you don't have to do that. It's just like, yeah, it's it feels like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> that and i'll play the college football when it comes up i'm gonna get i'll play that again because with it coming back ncaa college football yeah yeah huge huge announcement right EA yeah college football 25 first title in 10 years and because of nil players are getting money for being in the video game which is yeah. really a, a first of its kind deal so um yeah super exciting i i see what is snood michelle i don't know what snood is that was like an old, uh, kind of like Bejeweled. It was okay. initially a Mac game, and then it like lasted forever. It was a bit like Bejeweled, where you would shoot uh, colorful heads out of a cannon. Colorful heads, okay. Interesting. Oh, and I we got Mario Kart on too. accident. And the um, Nintendo, D I don't know what is that, the... The handheld version of Mario Kart, like where you can, oh, like on the Switch. Yeah, thank you. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. We so we got some gamers in here. War Thunder, um, NBA Two K, Madden, Guitar Hero, Tekken, Apex. No badminton. Okay, Grand Turismo. like in in real life or Gran Turismo, Minesweeper. Yeah, that's a good question. Not even Minesweeper. Yeah, they have a but... newer version too you can get on <laughs> as as we start i'm going to keep the cameras up on my screen and the chat open i really encourage you to ask questions as we move through i don't know do i just kind of jump into intros here Is i was about cool? to ask allison if she wanted to do her intro bit yes after you do the housekeeping oh uh, everyone please unless you're actively asking a question keep yourself muted but please 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 unmute and uh, make comments and ask questions. We want to be chatty today. Now, Allison, now you can All go. Right. Good afternoon. This is Allison McKee, and we are here to listen to 
Christopher Scroggins. Now, did I say that right? Where did that he was go? perfect. All righty. He's the academic director of eSports and the assist service assistant professor in the College of Applied Human Sciences. And you're here to provide an overview of the eSport industry, discuss the current eSport education landscape, and outline the benefits of implementing a holistic eSport program. So with that, Christopher, you're up. And there's Loki. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Loki and Allison and Michelle for the intro and housekeeping items. As Allison was saying, my name is Chris Groggins. I'm uh, the academic director of eSports at WVU. Um, I'm also a service assistant professor. We're housed in the College of Intercollegiate Programs. So right now we don't really have a home. Uh, my job as the director of the program is to uh, really collaborate with the Reed School of Media, the uh, College of B&E, and College of Applied Human Sciences, right? So I'm working with the deans and the, the, the colleges um, to really make this academic major and minor uh, a reality. And so uh, really first of its kind in the interdisciplinary nature and approach that we uh, have taken here at WVU, we'll talk all about what we're doing and, and how exciting it is, but also want to dive into kind of what is esports, right? Um, and so, with that, I ask esports, what is it? Please feel free to use chat. Um, you can unmute and and blurt out. Uh, you know, I I love conversation, but in your own words, what is esports? Competitive gaming uh, for money. I don't know. Okay, competitive gaming. I heard another competitive gaming. James says electronic sports. Um, quite literally by, yes. I, a lot of people ask, what is the E in front of sports? It stands for electronic, right? So uh, electronic sports, you're spot on. Uh, competitive gaming, anyone else? Video games. Video games, right? And so uh, there are a few nuances between esports and just casually playing video games, right? Um uh, so looking at a definition of esports, uh, an ecosystem comprised of publishers, teams, players, fans, and relevant business stakeholders that cooperate to produce a high quality production in which competitive video games are the main medium of entertainment. Of course, as a faculty, I have to, you know, research it, you know, and make it sound super fancy. Essentially, what we're looking at here is um, an ecosystem of professionals and players and, and third party companies that put on competitive video game tournaments, right? Um, so within esports and shoutcasters, yeah, I love that. Within esports, we typically see uh, that they require a high level of skill, right? So if we were all to just hop in the video game right now, it probably wouldn't be esports, not to undermine our gaming abilities as a group, but uh, these players are practicing 40 to 60 hours a week at times at the professional level, right? If not more. And so... Uh, people that are top of their game uh, are practicing at, at the rate of a full-time job, if not more. Uh, also, typically has spectators. So as James said in chat, shoutcasters, right? So there's a broadcast. The shoutcasters are kind of like the play-by-play. -play. They're shouting over the action. And people are watching. Just like I could be live streaming my gameplay right now, and I would have spectators watching me play video games, right? And so... If you're not familiar with that, you can go to YouTube and watch people live stream video gameplay or twitch.tv. It's the most popular gaming platform. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Our program has um, a profile on each, so you can follow us on YouTube and follow us on Twitch. And I can provide that information if, if people are interested. Also, esports oh, esports are organized, right? So as I say here, it's an ecosystem. Um, a ton of different stakeholders within it. And so a lot of times when we think esports, we think picking up the controller or playing or someone on a keyboard and mouse competing in a video game. But there's a ton of organization and there's a org chart behind the scenes. So there's companies just like in traditional sports that are broadcasting the events. There's organizations that are providing hospitality and event management services. Uh, you know, there's there's finance people, accountants, there's even law firms that specialize in esports contract law now, right? Because you have young people 
um, looking to make a lot of money and they need someone to advocate for their rights and to ensure that they're protected in those business deals. And so um, not only are the actual tournaments that we're watching, are they organized? The ecosystem itself has an, an org chart, right? And it, it has this hierarchy, if you will. And so it is just like a Fortune 500 company. In fact, some of the publishers that create these video games are massive. You know, Activision Blizzard got acquired by Microsoft recently for, I believe it was $68 billion. That's with a B. And so we're looking at companies that, what is that, 11 figures? Uh, and, and so there's there's a lot of organization uh, and revenue and prizes involved, right? So the last part of esports that we typically see is, you know, Allison and I could be competing in a game against each other. She's probably going to beat me. Um, you know, if we pat her on the back, that's great. She gets bragging rights. But ultimately in esports, there's something on the line, whether that's money or a trophy or a gift card, whatever it is, you're 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 playing for something and it really raises those stakes, right? We see people get highly competitive even when there's just a little prize involved. Um, I see Eric asked in chat, sorry, my camera was blocking it. Uh, is music production part of the ecosystem of esports? Um, yeah, James says it's not a competitive part, but content creation means a lot of different things. Yes, you nailed it. So, I do know that there are some agencies that create music for content creators because you can't have copyrighted sounds in your content or else you won't be able to make money off of them, right? So there are agencies that create original music for creators, but also video game audio and music is a massive industry now. There's awards for video game audio of the year, and um, there's even classes on it at some institutions that I've worked with in the past, you know, uh, video game music, video game audio. So um, I meant content creation. Oh, yes. Music production, as far as content creation, I would say yes and no. Uh, most of the content creation, though, is uh, people watching the gameplay or watching like a vlog, right? Like a video blog of someone's life. So it's like following them to the grocery store as they prepare for their day and, and all these things. So not a ton of music creation within that content creation, but um Again, copyright is something that we talk about within the industry that is music related. Sorry about that. So to give you all an idea, streams like to have unique music. Yes, exactly. To give you an idea of the overall industry, here's some data that I've uh, scraped in the past. Uh, this is as of end of 2022. So this doesn't include last year, but you can see the annual revenue for esports is approaching $1.5 billion. So um, I would say it's higher now. Uh, so we're, we're a multi-billion dollar industry. And then you see some of these titles down here on this other chart are some of the most popular esports titles. So we have League of Legends, Call of Duty, Valorant, Counter-Strike, and Super Smash Brothers. Um, Super Smash Brothers is orange. If you look at the bottom... It is the very, uh, it's the one that's the lowest on the chart. Um, but if you look at that, that's over 300 million hours of content watched in Super Smash Brothers alone. So the numbers on the left are actually in millions. So League of Legends at the end of 2022 was approaching 8 billion hours of watch time online. Uh, you know, some of these esports broadcasts are... Uh, have comparison Nielsen ratings of NHL games and other traditional sports titles, right? And so uh, we're seeing a lot of people tuning into esports and we're seeing it as an opportunity to reach populations that maybe aren't typically still tuning into what we call linear media, right? Like the, the days of waiting and watching TV every Tuesday are a thing of the past for the people that are tuning into esports. They're watching it live, online, and consuming content a lot. Um, James, you ask, where are you getting your market research? So this data is scraped from, uh, I believe this was compiled from twitchtracker.com. Um, there's also another free website called twitchmetrics.net. Uh, and uh, they have an API that they pull straight from Twitch. And then you can download CSV files and stuff. And then I clean the data and, and visualized it. Um, but I would recommend checking those sources out if you all want to research into viewership at all. But so now that we know esports, right? I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions at the end. 
Um, let's jump into esports and schools. So as of now, there's hundreds of colleges competing in what we call NACE Star League. So this is a tournament um, that is put on by Playfly Esports, which is a large company that uh, comes from traditional sports. And then NACE, which is kind of like the NCAA of collegiate esports. It stands for the National Association of Collegiate Esports. And so within their league, they have over 20,000 students competing in esports at varying levels, right? Um, they can be at the top level. They could be in a development level. Um, but we see tens of thousands of students at the collegiate level competing in esports. Um, we at WVU, and we'll get into this, have a varsity level esports team. Um, and that falls under different you know, departments on some campuses. So on our campus, we fall under student life. Uh, I believe they're actually a subsector of campus recreation. But uh, and. Uh, I've worked with institutions where their esports department is housed under athletics. That's really common in D3 schools, especially where scholarships aren't really a thing. And so um, they can provide a lot more resources to their esports athletes, um, but not, they don't have to provide scholarships if they consider them varsity under athletics, right? Uh, and then I've seen, so before WBU, I was at Shenandoah University and our esports department was housed under the School of Business. So um, I've seen esports departments housed under academic colleges or departments as well. Uh, it is important to note if you know people in high school looking to get involved that more than 90% of the schools that offer esports have some form of scholarship. Uh, so there are academic esports scholarships. Those typically range higher, I would say between six and $14,000 a year in, in aid. Um, and then there are competitive scholarships, and those range from as little as, you know, eight hundred dollars. The average is about two thousand, all the way up to full rides. So we do offer esports scholarships uh, for competitors at WVU. We will be offering academic scholarships as the major continues to grow and expand. Right. Um, David asks: Is collegiate level esports teams, although not fully under Department of Athletics at WVU, establishing NIL funds to compensate team members? So. They get scholarships. They do not get paid. Um, you know, there's no cost of living stipend or something that you would typically see in traditional sports. Um, so we don't have an NIL fund yet. I know that the competitive side just set up um, their foundations account. I think that's how you can start raising money for stuff like that. And so they do have plans to offer more incentives and support to our varsity players uh, in the future. But as of now, no NIL deals for those players. Yeah, and then over 120 schools worldwide offer some sort of esports curriculum program or offering. Um, this is kind of misleading, this, this stat. Uh, this research study that I pulled this from, the academic programs could range from one class all the way up to a full-fledged major, right? So I would say really the amount of schools that are offering a major like we do at West Virginia um, there's probably about two dozen, maybe. Um, and so we are really um, at the forefront of something here. And we're starting to see the student interest really uh, increase as we begin to market the program. So while there are a lot of academic offerings, there's not a ton of esports related majors at higher ed institutions yet. And then we can't forget high school, right? I mean, not every learner goes to college. Um, there's thousands of high schools around the country competing in local, state, and national esports competitions, and they're also starting to adopt esports-related curriculum. So outside of my role at West Virginia, I, I also act as the CEO of an ed tech firm, and we work with K through 20 um, institutions to implement esports, right? And we're seeing a ton of high schools start adopting um, not only competition, but curriculum as well. So you can start as early as middle school hone your craft and your skills in uh, high school, and then go pursue an education in it now at the collegiate level or enter straight into the workforce. So I've done enough talking. Time for y'all to post and chat or unmute again. Why have an esports program? What are the benefits of having esports at WVU or at a high school um, or insert any institution, right? What are the benefits of esports and academia?
All right. I see James saying interactive STEM for kids. Definitely. Anyone else have anything to add? It almost be like a trade because a lot of people go into different that don't want to go to college. I know this is college, but it gives them another route to learn a skill, I guess you could say, or make money from their skills. Definitely. Yeah. So um, get industry specific knowledge, right? I mean, there are nuances to esports. Yes, we borrow a lot from um, traditional sports and entertainment and hospitality, you know, all of these disciplines, but certainly you nailed it. Uh, attract additional students to maintain an increased enrollment. Definitely. A uh, direction for kids who are going to play games anyways. Uh, bingo, Judith. I mean, the yeah. first time I ever taught eSports 101, I looked around the classroom and I was like, man, I mean, you got a bunch of 18-year-olds, you know they're gaming. And I said, how many of you game every day? Everyone raised their hand. I said, okay, keep your hands up until I until it doesn't relate to you. I said, how many of you game more than two hours a day? Almost every hand stayed up. Over four hours a day, every hand stayed up. Over five hours, some started to go down. When in reality, I pulled my students and they were gaming on average five to eight hours a day, right? Uh, if they weren't in class or at the gym or hanging out with friends, they were gaming. Um, and so it's a way to, uh, you know, reach them through what they're passionate about. And so number one here, there's a lot of words on this. I'll kind of go down it, but um, esports and academia allows us to celebrate learners' passions, right? And that seems like a lot of buzzwords and, and might be um, what every major does, but um, you can teach things that typically students would shut down when you're talking about in a way that draws in their interest. Did I hear someone? I might have just got some feedback, but, uh, you know, for example, I can talk about finance and economics through the lens of esports, and students are hanging on to every word because we're talking about their favorite organization, their favorite video game. And wouldn't you know that uh, Fortnite's free to play versus Call of Duty, that's $60, but the average Fortnite player spends $84 a year compared to $60 on Call of Duty, right? So a free to play game can generate more revenue than a game that costs money up front. And going into the finance, the economics behind that, the sociology and psychology, uh, students really are interested in it. And so we're taking traditional disciplines and subject matter and teaching them through the lens of esports, right? Um, I call these students alternative achievers. Uh, typically, they're not going to be the captain of the football team or even, you know, first chair in the band. They're going to be the people that have been in their rooms playing and oftentimes in their virtual and online communities are the best of the best in their game or, or their community. Um, we get to celebrate them in public now, in the classroom, in the arena. We have a community for them and there's no longer a negative stigma around um, being a gamer, right? Uh, we, we can learn through that, uh, as someone said earlier. Um, we teach transferable skills, as I was saying, um, STEM-related industries, um, digital citizenship. A lot of these students come in not really truly understanding that um, their virtual actions have consequences. And so how do you navigate through this digital realm and do it in a productive way? Um, also, soft skills, hard skills, cognitive benefits. So we see a lot of people say soft skills, um, we call it social emotional learning, right? So how to disagree with peers, how to have difficult conversations, how to um, overcome stress and adversity and competition. Like all of these things are things that you learn through traditional sports and, and other environments, but these learners might not be in those communities. And so we're giving them an outlet to learn through esports and gaming. Um, I never will forget, and I, and I see Jeff in chat. I, I'll get to you in a second. Um, I'll never forget, I, I was teaching event management, uh, esports event management, and the class, I, I delivered some baseline information, and then it was supposed to really be a place for students to fail, right? Which sounds weird, but learning through doing and, and learning through that failure that they experienced, because ultimately I wasn't going to fail them, and they knew that, but they were doing things they had never done before, and they were so passionate about it. Two students got in a disagreement, and I had to sh kind of mediate the conversation and shut it down, and each of those individuals came to me separately without the other knowing, saying, that's the first time I've ever disagreed with a peer in public, and I don't think I handled it well. How can I handle that better? 
And that's what's going to make better business people and better professionals and better global citizens, right? And they were doing that through esports event management. That's such a powerful story that I always tell and uh, just blew me away that two, you know, 19 to 21 year olds um, had the maturity to acknowledge that they didn't handle it well, but want to seek how to handle it better in the future. But I'll pause here. I, I see Jeff. He says, just so I don't forget, I'm in the media business, filming, editing, et cetera. There's a small business within esports as far as media, editing, highlight clips, filming, et cetera. Definitely want to hear more uh, from you about what your thoughts are on that and if it's a plausible source of income for a media person like myself. Jeff, definitely. So prior to WVU and, and the company that I run outside of it, I owned an esports and entertainment company. And I wish I knew you back then. Um, so we'll, we'll, we can dive into some of that. And I'd love to give you my contact info. But Digital media and content creation is a passion of mine. Um, but as I was saying, esports provides a community for learners. Um, at an institution that has an esports major, we polled some students, right? And of the students that took the poll, about 28% said, I wouldn't have been here if it weren't for esports competition. 53% said, I would not have been here unless there were esports courses. But 71%, over 70% of those learners said, because of esports, they felt more plugged into the overall campus community, right? So their campus identity was increasing because of esports. And I think that is a really important um, piece of data because as we approach the enrollment cliff of 2025 in education, I'd be remiss or we would be remiss if we ignored that. We need to find ways to engage with learners and to retain those learners once they're at the institution, right? And we see esports as a tool to do that. And then some studies that are in preparation but haven't been published yet that I've worked on have shown that esports students benefit from enhanced goal setting, uh, enhanced attention to detail, and increased work ethic, believe it or not. A lot of times these varsity level programs and the academic programs um, give structure. Uh, when I went to college, it, it sounds counterproductive, but I joined a fraternity for that structure. Um, but there were bylaws, there was a constitution, there was a grade point average I had to follow. And I, I stuck to that, right? I needed that guiding um, kind of policies and procedures to get me through the first couple of years of college. And we see esports as that tool for learners. They are able to set goals in competition or the classroom. Um, and they're so engaged with it that their work ethic and attention to detail increases. With that, I'm going to go over uh, an overview of what we're doing at WVU. We'll still talk about some of the benefits we're seeing. Um, but yeah, let's dive into this. So as a department, we seek to provide an environment where students can develop academically, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and socially, right? So um, oftentimes we have uh, a course about wellness and, and, and best practices. We want to develop learners holistically. Um, we look at the eight dimensions of wellness and we um, structure the, the programs of study and the experiences around those, right? And so a lot of times the curriculum, it might not be explicit that we're talking about the dimensions of wellness, but it is informed by the dimensions of wellness. And we're looking to develop learners holistically through esports and gaming. And so how do we do that? Um, experiential learning opportunities, right? And so some examples of this um, are international travel. We're, we're hopefully going to be start traveling. Again, we're in the first year, so we didn't really have a ton of opportunity to establish uh, international travel opportunities, but we plan to do so. Um, student organizations, we'll talk about this a bit later, but um, the Esports Skill Development Club, or ESDC, just launched. Um, I'm the uh, faculty advisor of it, and it's a platform for students to network and develop professionally. Um, through esports and gaming, right? You don't have to be a major, you don't have to be a minor, you don't have to be a competitor. You could be a nursing major, but love esports and be in the ESDC and gain those experiences. Um, also, we're starting to establish uh, relationships with industry partners for internships and experiential learning opportunities. Um, really, my goal here is to start learners early, right? Like typically when I look at an esports resume, it's six weeks of experience or one semester's worth. We want to get learners plugged in as early as the end of sophomore year so that they can have a prolonged experience so that employers can say, OK, this person not only is qualified as far as the skills they have, but we know they're dependable as well. And so we want to start uh, providing those opportunities early on. 
And then broadcast production, digital media management, et cetera. Um, I'll stop sharing here and I'm gonna share a different screen if y'all don't mind. Oh boy, share screen, here we go. Um, perfect. And so here's an example. It's not like exciting gameplay, but um, how do I get this down here? Hold on, sorry, there we go. It is an example of some content. So we do have student uh, worker positions. So some students get paid to produce content for us. Others volunteer their time. Um, but uh, we have a digital media strategist within the department. He was previously with University Relations, I believe. Um, but he works with us. He has consistent programming with these students now. This is called the Respawn. So it comes on every Thursday, I believe. Um, Leadership that you've seen. This from is this from last Valentine week. So, so far, they go over. Uh, WVU sort of gameplay the from the so week. Far. They the show our Valorant really team the here. Uh, you hear them so commentating the over. It has to come in and be like, "Hey guys, we're still in this position. We still have the ability to win these games." And uh, so far, Anox has been doing a great job as that, and and really feel fulfill that role as a as a leader. Yes, team, and I think a lot of it comes down sort of with that pro. Uh, send now, it down to Gabe, who's talking with our a our academic director, uh, Chris Scroggins. And of course, I chose the video with me Thank in it so that there's the like intro. this weird uh, inception Gabe, moment, I'm right? Here with um, our academic director. But you see, throughout this, you can find it on our YouTube. Um, these are student workers interviewing me. They were preparing, you know, several days before. Uh, we have multiple camera angles. It zooms in, it zooms out. They work with audio. Students edited this video, and so while a lot of the the, the courses are focused around business. A lot of the experience surrounding the coursework is focused on that entertainment aspect, right? And so um, this is something that we're growing and we're making uh, higher and higher quality and more professional weekly. Um, but you can search WVU Esports on YouTube and subscribe. Uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Shameless plug. Awesome. Any questions about anything so far? Again, we're, we're looking to develop learners holistically through experiential learning opportunities. Uh, and of course, the coursework as well. However, um, once you get past the lower level courses, there's not a lot of lecture in the program. Um, but to give you an overview uh, the, of the academic side of esports currently, there's uh, esports business and entertainment major officially launched this semester. Uh, we have as of fall, this coming fall, we have 17 learners declared for the major, which is really great considering we just started the marketing for the actual major. So uh, with very little marketing, we're starting to see uh, upwards of 20 or so students declaring the, the major. Um, happy to report there's only one internal transfer of that. So all the others are first time freshmen or transfers from other institutions who otherwise would not have been at West Virginia University, right? So um, that's a huge plus for us that we're drawing in new students and we expect once we start marketing it, um, it to grow rapidly. You say WVU Esports? Yes, I believe it's just WVU Esports like that. Uh, we have a minor Esports Management. So we are, it was previously all online asynchronous. We are also starting to add some courses so that it can be a hybrid. Uh, we find that a lot of our Esports competitors want to minor in Esports. Um, but they don't want to take all online courses if they're on the Morgantown campus, right? So uh, we are trying to increase the options and opportunities for learners by making it a hybrid minor, and that should go live uh, fall of this year. And then as I was saying earlier, our eSports Skill Development Club, it is an SSO, so it's not fully a departmental supported organization. However, um, the eSports Academic Department will support it to a certain degree. And it's a student organization for esports professional development, experiential learning, and networking. And um, so as the department continues to grow, any uh, internship opportunities, travel opportunities will be offered to students uh, who are part of this club prior to um, posting it in the general community uh, uh, discord, if you will. But uh, here's a lot of graphics uh, or visuals, but I wanted to visualize kind of our theory or around the development of this, right? And and so pyramid's kind of the best way I could visualize the scaffolding of it. Uh, but we start at the bottom with 101 and 201. I would throw our esports wellness course in here as well. And these set the foundation for an understanding 
of esports. It, it talks about the nuances between esports and other industries. And we get into some of the ethical issues that we're seeing not only in esports, but within society. So um, really in these courses, we want to lay the foundation for their esports knowledge, but we also want to lay the foundation of their understanding of themselves and others within their cohort, right? And so uh, a lot of social emotional learning, they're exploring esports and, and uh, a lot of different ways. And a lot of the assignments give them creative freedom to explore esports and gaming. But then we move into some of the esports core courses. Again, it's an interdisciplinary um, venture. So we see B core prefixes, we see sport management prefixes, and original ESPT or esports prefixes. Um, so this is esports business, esports governance, esports marketing, and esports event management. Uh, and the core of the curriculum delivers specialized knowledge regarding the different sectors and topics within and outside of the industry. And it ends with event management prior to getting into their final courses so that they can apply everything they've learned, again, hands-on learning, and they can actually see it come to life in front of them. And then ESPT 480 and 491 really round that out. So um, that senior capstone, and then um, it, it is uh, professional field experience. So uh, it concludes with professional field experience and a capstone so that they can um, form forge better relationships with their peers who are about to become their colleagues. They can reflect on their experience. They host and put on an, a virtual esports panel where they focus on a selected topic and start to then build their network with people within the industry. Um, and so with this, you know, they are partaking in experiential learning, not only in the higher level, but throughout they are getting those experiences that are so valuable for development and growth. Our competitive esports department. So this is our varsity level teams. We support currently Rocket League, Valorant, and Madden. Um, Rocket League in December won the national championship, so we're really proud of them. And Valorant came in second, so we had both of our teams on the main stage. I believe they were competing in Texas. Um, they were on the national broadcast, and then so just really proud of our, our teams. And then Madden, Noah Johnson, our Madden player, um, won the national championship at least once, if not twice. He is uh, highly skilled. Uh, someone asked about NIL earlier. I believe he has had some opportunities there because of his national notoriety for his gameplay. Um, we do have a Call of Duty team. It's not supported right now. Just the roster fluctuated a lot. Uh, some of the students had to drop out. And so we're currently looking to recruit more Call of Duty players. If you know any students who are great at Call of Duty, let us know and, and we'll put them into the tryouts. Um, so our varsity players compete and practice at the varsity space in University Place. So we actually do have a an esports space on campus. It's in U Place, just off campus. Uh, has about 24 PCs, has an area where they can strategize on a whiteboard, has a small broadcast area that they're looking to grow, um, has some office spaces on the next floor up. Uh, and, and so not big enough quite yet for us to open it up to the community. Uh, but we're looking for a larger space as we uh, grow as a program to have a community space and a varsity practice space. Because when you combine the two, it can get really, really loud. So it's good to have the option to have it in one place, but have two separate spaces for community and practice as well. Um, and as I said, we've won ne multiple national titles already. If you go to the provost office, uh, you'll see trophies and rings from the teams that they bring back. And, and, and so we're really proud of them. Do the sports management classes include students in other sports? Kathy, I, can you um, elaborate on that? I'm not sure if I'm understanding that question. I didn't know if your students were all esports students or does it go across the border to other sport sure. education? So, you know, right now in the courses, because we just launched the first major courses, we opened it up for other disciplines and other majors to uh, enroll in. We anticipate as we grow those, of course, the major classes will be locked down to major uh, esports majors. But like our 101s and 201s, we plan to uh, keep those open. We would love to offer them as like um, a Jeff. Sorry, it was escaping my mind. But um, I don't think that's really feasible right now, um, but we will make them open electives, our 101 and 201, so that other students can take them. Uh, we did open up the minor asynchronous courses to anyone as well, um, but we are starting to see the minor grow so quickly that we're going to have to restrict those to minors only. 
Uh, but the entry level courses, uh, anyone can take on campus. In fact, my 101 class has a lot of uh, sport management, business. There's a couple esports majors in there, um, like engineering. There, there, it is awesome. Political science. I have several political science majors in there. It's really cool to see people come together and and learn through what they're passionate about, but also have skill sets and knowledge bases in so many different things, right? And so it's a really cool experience. Uh, but yeah, Kathy, long answer short, 101, 201, anyone can take. The other courses are going to be restricted as we move forward just because uh, we don't have the capacity right now to to take on any uh, any more than one section of those upper level courses, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah. With devices and apps growing exponentially in VR as esports enter this arena, Stanley, thanks for that question. So yes and no. Um, there are some VR esports. Uh, there's a game called Onward. Uh, it's like a VR first person shooter, and there are some competitions in it. You can search it on YouTube and they'll do like aerial views of them playing and you just see like, you know, people squatting up and down. It looks kind of silly, but the gameplay is awesome. I, I mean, it's really intense. That being said, there's not a ton of super popular VR esports titles yet, uh, but we're seeing uh, community centers on campuses that uh, have esports incorporating VR to some degree, right? So um, a few facilities off the top of my head, like I know UNC Greensboro in North Carolina has a VR station. Um, I've talked to folks at Syracuse. I think they have a VR station in their community space. So um, not a ton of VR esports yet, but esports spaces are starting to adopt VR uh, as an opportunity. That's a great question. And then our collegiate gaming clubs. So uh, we cannot ignore the club level because I really think that this is what bridges the gap between a lot of the learners who don't have a spot at that varsity level, right? We can only field a certain amount of players at that top level, but that also allows for a lot of opportunity at the club level. And so we have hundreds of students competing at the club level on campus. It's called the Collegiate Gaming Club or the CGC. Um, it's a student-led organization. They have lots of different games they compete in. They run local events and any student is welcome to join the Discord. Discord's an app that gamers use to communicate. Um, you can actually go to the uh, esports website. And I believe that the esports discord link is on there. And I think that the, the CGC discord link might be on there as well. So, um, you know, this is where, this is a really great selling point for me as the academic director, because a lot of students still want to compete. But again, we have national champions. We have the best of the best of their craft. You know, they, these, a lot of these players are also playing on pro teams in their spare time. And so that's, that's, kind of intimidating and, and hard to make a squad, but we have all these club teams that learners can still compete while they pursue their education. And so um, this is just like, you know, varsity level traditional sports and club traditional sports. Um, some of the best competitors at the institution are club level, right? And some of our club teams would give varsity programs a run for their money. But in summary, WVU esports students are prepared to be oh, sorry, productive professionals and global citizens by taking a curriculum backed by theory and best practice, uh, a curriculum that's interdisciplinary in nature, and that has practical lessons that they can apply in everyday life, right? Um, also, uh, they are empowered to seek further opportunities to enrich their experience, whether that's working on broadcast production, um, working event management, whatever that might be, we are constantly working with our students and we will continue to develop and expand these opportunities for them to find um, opportunities outside of the classroom or the arena. Uh, also, they're engaging in lessons and courseworks that help develop them holistically, as we talked about earlier. Uh, but with that, I would love to open it up for questions. I know there was a lot as we were going through. I tried to keep it to about 45 minutes so we'd have plenty of time. But anything about esports in general, esports at WVU, I am all ears. Ask away. Chris and Cohen, uh, you mentioned the curriculum. You didn't really give a lot of detail. Obviously, they have to take all the GE courses. Uh, how do these courses, I guess, separate out by how many of them involve 
CS and, and other kinds of computer skills versus the actual design element. That's, I mean, never having designed one of these games, <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly the, the, the skills that are involved in putting these games together. And I assume they might become specialist in one aspect or another, because that's all these games now have many, many people that create that create them. Right. Great question, Stan. So um, our major does not focus on computer science or game design. Um, there is a game design program on campus. However, um, we don't dive into that in the esports business and entertainment major. Uh, we are talking about collaborating with that program a bit. Um, you know, they're designing games. Maybe we test them and play them, right? Um, our major really focuses on the business and, and entertainment side of things. And so, um, great question. Our, our majors kind of structured like this. They take all their general electives. Um, they are required to minor and, you know, have a minor. Uh, we have areas of emphasis within the major. So currently we have esports business development and esports marketing. Um, we're also expanding two more in, in the coming semesters to um, esports, digital media, social media, and communications, and esports broadcast production. And so learners take the esports core. They take their, uh, they have general electives. They have their Jeff courses. They then minor and have an area emphasis to specialize in a business or entertainment topic. Um, so through interdisciplinary, through the collaboration with other programs, we plan to. Um, hopefully have them take some electives in game design and development stuff. However, uh, our faculty, that that is not our background. And so uh, we don't touch on that too much. We'll talk about how a design of a game might impact the performance in game or might impact the business of that title. Um, but we don't talk about actually developing uh, the title itself, if that makes sense. How many faculty are connected to your program? Yeah, great question. Uh, so currently I'm the only full-time faculty as we launch it. Um, we do have several adjuncts. So David Chin, who's a co-founder of FaZe Clan, uh, one of the biggest esports orgs in the world, he adjunct for us uh, last spring or last fall, sorry. Uh, we also have Grant Peranjape. He's the former vice president of... Uh, the Washington Justice, which is a professional Overwatch League team. Uh, he adjuncts, he's adjuncts for us every semester. And then we just brought in Jackie Haig. Um, she is a marketing guru. She managed the M&Ms brand for the better part of a decade. So all the mini M&Ms commercials, she's the brain behind those. She uh, developed those and, and came up with the creative concepts of them. And she's teaching our esports marketing courses. And so right now, uh, I'm a, the full-time faculty, but we have, you know, three, four adjuncts that are making uh, a lot of our asynchronous online courses possible. Uh, as we expand into next year and, and uh, we plan to hire another full-time person on the academic side so that we can continue to support in-person classes on campus. So is Jackie with the College of Business and Economics or? Uh, Jackie's contract, because so... Esports marketing is through uh, the College of Applied Human Sciences. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's a great question. So, Grant is contracted through uh, business and through BNE. Uh, right. Our other uh, adjuncts are contracted through CAHS. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. This is all Greek to me, and, and I'm <laughs> I, I speak modern Greek quite fluent. Oh, this was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you for joining us. Anyone else have any questions? I was gonna say now's the time to ask. They're usually a chatty bunch, but maybe they're thinking about a lot of the stuff that you said. You know, I Googled the uh, esports because I know nothing about it. You know, it. It says something about the sedentary problem 
uh, you know, I mean, is that a problem? You know, if you're you're on the computer for you know a, a whole day, it, it 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 you know you miss your meals, you miss uh, you whatever. <laughs> Certainly, no, it is. I mean, we start talking about that as early as one hundred and one, just so people are cognizant of it, because they again, until I asked my students, they didn't realize they were gaming eight hours a day. Right, that's a long time to be seated. Even when I work, I get up and walk around at least. Um, and so, you know, we talk about it in 101, we talk about it in 201, and then we have our esports wellness and, and performance class where we go into best practices and health and well-being. And so um, I've seen students at other institutions apply those lessons um, to not only in, improve their gameplay, right? Like, uh, believe it or not, like the time you eat before a match really dictates your performance because of digestion and, and like it makes sure. you lethargic and all of these things. And so we go we go over the half life of caffeine. We go over um, proper diets and nutrition, ergonomics, all of these different things within the major um, so that not only can they live a healthier life, but they can be more informed about it as they enter the industry to hopefully solve some of those issues of the sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. Uh yeah. Jim, what is your vision of where this discipline may evolve to at WVU in five or 10 years? Wow. That is, you know, I think I should immediately have an answer to that. I'm going to be completely transparent and say, that's the first time I've heard that. But I will say this, uh, my vision for the, for esports at WVU um, in the next five to 10 years is our academic to become a program, right? So that we're not competitive here, academics here, and we operate in silos. I want to be a, a department on campus where we can um, cross collaborate and, and have really great experiences for our learners. And I want it to look almost like a working college. And if what I mean by that is uh, students come in and are essentially employed by our department, right? And maybe that the economics aren't feasible out of the gate, but I think the best way to learn is by doing, and certainly they're going to have classroom time and other things, but uh, we can't teach them about finance sitting in a chair and then send them out into the esports, you know, field and expect them to be comfortable first day on the job. And so I want to give them those experiences within the department, have them enter in as a freshman, as an entry level employee and work their way up and, and collaborate with their peers who want to specialize in these different kind of, um, subject matters within the esports discipline, if that makes sense. So um, what we see a lot of times right now is esports majors are simply come to the classroom, teach, like lecture, or, okay, we'll go to the arena and we'll play a game we talked about in class. No, they need to be coming and they need to be looking at P&L sheets and budgets and um, discussing how they can make our program flourish, because ultimately, if they're not invested, the program won't succeed, right? And so I want it to be a student-led experience where they are doing a lot of the operations and planning for the major. And as the director, I'm simply helping connect them with the right people to execute those things. And so um, that's not very specific, but I foresee us having a, co a major of about 120 learners across any four-year cohort um, is, is really the goal we're looking to hit. Um, and those learners are mentoring and, and helping each other learn, right? And so I want it to be almost like a professional esports organization within WVU um, and act as an incubator, possibly, for uh, the ideas and, and, and business concepts that they have as they progress through their time. Can Do you market this? So we actually, that's a great question, Jim. Yeah, so... Uh, we are actually offering a class through early access for fall uh, of this year. So I'm developing our 101. I'm, I'm developing it into an asynchronous format. So we will have an online esports 101 class for high school learners uh, that opened today. So if you know any high school learners who are interested and they're in the early access program, um, they can register as of today. Um, we also have talked with the regional recruiters. So we are starting to actively market to high schools both in and out of West Virginia. Um, and really my my recruitment strategy is I'm a former semi-professional Call of Duty player. Um, if they can beat me, they're in, right? Obviously they have to go through the admissions process, but that always intrigues students. Let's hop on a game, let's play, and let me answer your questions why we play, right? And so I'll actually be doing that 
we're going to do a 24 hour live stream during the day of giving coming up. And there's going to be a segment where I'm just playing Call of Duty with current students, perspective, perspective students, answering questions and, and having fun while doing it. Right. So we are starting to actively market to high school students. Yes. Any other questions? These are all great. This might be a good, let's see if I'm here. Am I muted or not? We can hear you. Okay. This might be a good topic to revisit in a year to see how you've developed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, it, it, it'll be interesting. Um, but no, certainly I'm, oh, I stopped sharing. Did it stop sharing? Perfect. Um, I'm more than happy to, you know, come back if anyone has questions that they can't think of right now. Um, let me actually put my email in the chat. If y'all have any questions, you can reach me there. Um, if you want to hop on a game, I... I don't get to game that much anymore. I got two little ones at home, but um, sometimes in the evenings I get to sneak away and play some Call of Duty. So if anyone wants to learn, uh, I'm happy to hop in a game and teach you Call of Duty or whatever game you want to play. Or if you already compete in Call of Duty, uh, I would love uh, to compete with you. So uh, really appreciate all of y'all's attention and, and just being interested in esports. You know, I, at the end of the day, uh, again, there's been such a negative stigma around gaming and esports over the years. And so um, anytime we get a chance to educate about the discipline and, and the topic, it, it's uh, hopefully, you now have some talking points to go out and start talking about it with others. Right. And if they say, well, that's dumb, um, rather than get defensive, what I tell the students in our majors is let's educate. Right. And um, ultimately, some people aren't going to change their mind about it. And, and that's OK. Um, but we can equip ourselves with with the knowledge to go out and talk about it with others and, and engage in civil discourse right and so hopefully you got some talking points um hopefully no one's bad mouthing esports to you but if they do um just let them know our major at wvu is preparing productive citizens for the next step in their life right um so thank you so much all right well thank you very much i certainly know a lot more about esports than i did when you started and we look forward to um, perhaps next year and giving us an update on what was going on in esports at WVU. See how Perfect. It's developing. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. All righty, y'all. We'll be well. I, it's spring break for us next week, so hopefully it, the weather will hold up. I don't. I don't know if it's nice out. I'm down in my basement, but um, everyone enjoy your weekend. All right. Thank you, and thank you again for presenting to us. Of course.